Right, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this last non-farm payrolls webinar of 2015 with me, Michael Hewson, my colleague Colin Suzinski in Canada. Hello, Colin. Hello, Michael. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping, risk warning, um, putting, up on, uh, putting up on the screen in front of you. I have to do that for compliance purposes, but um, once we've got that out of the way, um, we, we can basically get cracking and talk about certainly, obviously, what's coming up, but also those those massive events that we um, sat through yesterday afternoon when Mr. Draghi decided to lead the markets up the garden path um, with respect to what he was planning to do um, with respect to the QE program yesterday. Um, and I think it's quite interesting, and I'm, I know Colin's got a view on this, but what I think is quite interesting about what happened yesterday was the fact that um, the markets were just completely wrong-footed by it, completely wrong-footed by it. And what it's done is it's created a number of very key reversals, and I think that the dollar uptrend that we've been in for the past two or three years is now at an end. We're at a turning point. I think we've seen the base potentially in the euro. And we could well actually start to rebound back towards 115. So the question is, what's you know? The question I think most people will ask is, well, why do you think that? And a um, number of reasons, but obviously my approach is a technical-based approach, and we'll be looking at the key indices um, to look at some of the key levels. Going to be starting with. Uh, the S&P, and well, actually we'll start with the UK 100, because what we saw yesterday was a significant reversal within a broader sideways formation, but within an uptrend that we've been in since August. It's a very That's a strong, nice ascending triangle. It is a nice ascending triangle here. We've got a series of peaks around about 6,450. Um, and you know, at the, at the moment, I think what we've got to decide is what's going to be the catalyst for pushing the dollar even lower. Now, there has been some speculation that Mr. Draghi held back on the stimulus because he perceived that the Federal Reserve was going to hike rates, hike, hike rates, hike rates um, at its December meeting. Um, I would certainly think that. Um, that's still a possibility. Certainly, the Fed funds suggests that there's a 76% possibility that the Fed will hike rates in December. I still don't think it's the nailed on certainty that people think that it is. It, you know, it, it probably will happen, but so there's that nagging voice in the back of my head telling me that the Federal Reserve will find some way to try and not do it. Um, you know they've been they've been putting it off and putting it off all year. So are they going to are they going to be the Grinch at Christmas in the same way that uh, Mr. Draghi has been? So my 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 bet on non-farm payrolls is a bit of an outlier. I'm going for 85,000 um, simply because I think hiring has been weak. The ISMs have been weak. Um, I think an awful lot of the job gains that we saw in October were basically brought forward. Um, from November and December in terms of hiring for retail. I could be wrong. Colin has a slightly different view. He's gone slightly more conservative. But overall, I think what we're going to see today is probably not going to shift the dial that much um, in terms of what to expect in two weeks' time. However, if we get a very, very weak number, it's certainly going to make things very, very interesting. If we get anything above 120, 130,000, I don't think we're going to get much of it. We're going to get much of a move. I think yesterday's move wiped out an awful lot of people, and I think a lot of people could well be sitting on their hands um, today in the in, in the event of a fairly neutral number. But let's go through the numbers and look at what the markets maybe are expecting. Can, you maybe I can on. mention some of my expectations, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, in. Okay, so uh, my feeling is on the on the um, employment that uh, I don't think Michael's that far off base. I think that uh, we're definitely going to see a, re a retrenchment for two reasons. First of all, I think the Fed's been signaling pretty strongly that they're going to go in December. And what we saw earlier when the when Main Street was expecting the Fed to raise rates in September, we saw a slowdown in jobs. And, and historically, around the time the Fed has started raising interest rates, we've had a slowdown in jobs. So we had the slowdown in September, then they didn't act, they had the bump in October, then uh, now 
now they've been spending the last month signaling towards a December hike. So it wouldn't surprise me to see a slowdown in jobs. Plus, the retail seasonal hiring in the States has been soft. The only companies that really bumped up hiring was Amazon and FedEx. Everybody else was flat to a little bit lower. And, and, and generally speaking, I think that we're – and the other part is I think we'll see a bit of a retrenchment. Last month, we had weak ADP and strong non-farm payrolls. On Wednesday, we had strong ADP. I think part of that was catch-up, and I think we'll see the gap close with non-farm payrolls. Now, I've been a little bit closer to uh, what the street's thinking. I'm thinking a retrenchment down to around 220 for uh, for U.S. jobs. But uh, with with the uh, with all the moving pieces around the holiday season and the uh, and the Fed meeting, it could go either way. You, I think you could have an inline number. I think you could just as easily have a number that is low that what uh, Michael's calling. But I think the uh, the key is, and, and it's something you mentioned. You would need a really really low number, I think, to change Fed expectations at, at this point. Michael uh, brought up 120. I think it might actually have to be a negative number to knock the Fed off course. But uh, generally speaking, I do think we'll see some fairly sizable swings around this uh, around this announcement. Absolutely. So again, so let's look, so let's let's look at the key support levels. We can see on the UK 100 where the key support level is. There, it's just below 6,200, round about. I would say 6,120. But what I did find particularly interesting when I looked at the US Russell 2000 was how we've we are trading in this nice little. Um, triangle here or wedge pattern here and we're very very near the support of that that uptrend line that blue line and that probably comes in round about um, 1160 but it's very interesting to note that the oscillators on all the major indices are turning over they're turning lower so that suggests to me that the line of least resistance for stock markets is towards the downside and not to the upside. Similar yes, thing on the S and P. No problem. Just so I wanted to mention, I've done. I had done a, a blog a couple of weeks ago that talked a little bit about how uh, what happened when the. Wh based on what the Fed did in December at their December meeting. And interestingly enough, it was the years the Fed went hawkish in, in any way, whether it was tapering or what have you. The markets went down the first half of December and then rebounded. The years the Fed went dovish, the markets went up the first half of December and then went down. So uh, certainly I think with, when we listen to what Michael's telling us, I definitely think we should look at this in terms of we could see some weakness certainly heading into the Fed meeting if people think they are going to raise uh, raise rates here. So that's quite, uh, quite significant. Sorry, Michael, please continue. I think you're right on these oscillators rolling over too. Probably getting a retrenchment here, but these ascent, bigger ascending triangles look pretty mm. interesting for the long term. What I also think is, I think if we get a rally in stock markets in the event of a uh, in the event of a, num a number that's outside expectations, then I think the rally probably will need to be sold into. I do not think that we're going to see any new highs between now yeah. and the end of the year. I think at the moment we're still within a range, and I think if you do get a, if you do get a, a rally higher, then I think it's unlikely we'll take out the highs that we've seen this week, and probably I, agree. I think it's unlikely that we'll take out the highs. Um, that we saw yesterday. Certainly, the oscillators seem to be pointing in that direction. And you know, as I said earlier, with respect to um, the the currencies, I think the line of least resistance now for euro dollar is for us to move higher. We look in, we look at the DAX. The DAX does appear to be pointing to a weaker a weaker close to the week. We can certainly see that on the weekly candle here. Mm -hmm. It's very aggressively down. If we close the week that way, then again the line of least resistance is, is lower. And a bigger clue, a bigger clue is in the bond market. Let's look at the two-year because this two-year chart is eye-watering. This is a daily chart. Okay, wow. we have a, had a key reversal day, and what we did yesterday when yields this this was. This was two year yields at 0.45%. In the space of one day, we made a new high, and then we also took out the November lows in the space of a single day. That's um, that incredible. Gives, that gives you an indication of how far bond markets were the wrong way in terms of what the ECB was going to do. Now, we're getting a little bit of a rebound today, but I think the damage has been done, and I think those yield differentials between U.S. Treasuries, two-year Treasuries, and uh, two-year German Treasuries could close in the Euro's favor. So if we then transpose that 
onto a euro dollar chart, which I have here. It gives you, a, this is the weekly chart, let me just change it to the daily so you can see what I'm talking about here. So again, look at, look at this move in euro dollar, but also look at the fact that we're now starting to turn positive. The big problem we've got at the moment is that we've got the 50, 100 and 200 day moving averages pretty much within about 100, 100 points of each other, between 109.50 and 110.50. So I don't think we're probably going to take out these, these particular moving averages in a day, but I think as long as we hold above 108.20.40, which basically was the previous breakdown level, the previous support that we saw here, as long as we hold above here, so if we get a dollar positive number, I would expect to see that we won't break back below 108. If we hold above 108, then I think it's quite conceivable that we can push back up, retest these moving averages, which did act as support all the way along here. If we get back above here, then over the course of the next few days and weeks, we could start to come back towards 112, 113. But we need to stay above 108, 20, 40 previous support. That, for me, is key. If we don't do that, then we're looking to go back lower again. So it's all about levels. Always has been. With me, I trade the levels, I trade what the price does, um, and I react to that accordingly. Um, so Euro-Dollar, I think, is going to be very, very key. If we look at the dollar index, again, this is a very compelling chart. What we've got here is, again, a tweezer top. We've got an aggressive move lower. That's very bearish in terms of the overall outlook. It's a very short-term chart, but on the continuous chart, again, it's very, very similar. So if we look at that on the weekly chart, it gives this is a similar sort of thing, a bearish reversal week where we've taken out the lows of the previous three weeks. Again, that is very negative. And also, Michael, on that one, you've got the failure at the 100 round number, which is very psychologically significant, that it, it's peaked above and just been pounded back down. Yeah. So I think... The, 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 ch the psychology of the market has changed. When, we, when I looked at the client sentiment yesterday, um, it was 93% short for euro dollar. It's now 76%. 76% of the cash positions are short. That could well be right. But what I think it does do is it limits the downside of any move lower. Because, because the market is still structurally quite short, I think it's going to make it very difficult for the market as we head into the end of the week to go much lower than that 108 level that I was talking about earlier. Obviously, that really depends on how good the jobs number is. But when you, when you actually look at what U.S. yields are in relation to the German yields, I think a rate rise has already been priced in. So I don't think even a good jobs number will make that much difference. A negative jobs number or a negative average earnings number could well invoke another short squeeze in euro dollar towards 110. I agree. I think the surprise is to the downside. Anything strong isn't going to change expectations. So again, let's have a look at cable. Cable looks as if it's going to break higher, but again here, what we've got, we've got to hold above 150, 20, 30. We could well look to test again the 50, 100, and 200 day moving average. Similar sort of story here. Let me just pull this out a little bit so that we can, we can see it. So there's the trend line through the highs. Um, We've managed to break above 150, 120, 30, but not with any conviction, so I'm a little bit concerned about the fact that we haven't been able to do that. But the fact that we haven't been able to dip much today in the long shadow on this candle does suggest to me that there's plenty of buying interest lower down. That's borne out again in the client sentiment, 85% short cash positions in cable at the moment. So again, I think if we do get a dip in cable, it'll probably be bought into, and that's going to going to limit the downside somewhat in the event of a fairly positive number. Dollar yen, similar sort of story. We're in a 122-124 range. We're slap bang in the middle of that at the moment. So with respect to dollar yen, I probably sit on my hands. It's in a, it's an in part, it's in a part of the market that I've got absolutely no interest in. Um, it, could go, it could easily go up as it could go down. It's 122, 124. It's boring. It's uninteresting. I'm not interested in Could we do dollar CAD in the last few seconds, Michael? Dollar CAD, yeah. We've got 30 seconds very quickly. 30 seconds. The top side. Go yeah, on, it Colin. still looks like it's 
t- uh, still looks like it's topping out and rolling over here. How oil acts around uh, 40 bucks is still going to be significant. The uh, last month, uh, CAD jobs were 44,000. The street's calling for retrenching back by 10,000. I think that's a little excessive. I think if that was the okay. expected, the uh, yeah. bank would have been more uh, negative. So, oh, I'm wrong. We got 35,000 declined for Canada, and what do we got for the U.S.? For for US. So it's pretty much in line. Revised upwards, yep. the 298 from 71. So all in all, that's a fairly positive dollar number, which should provoke a sell-off in euro dollar and cable. But again, as we said previously, I think you know the downside there could be fairly limited. Average earnings is pretty much in line with expectations. So we haven't really moved the dial. We're pretty much in line with expectations. You're going to get a bit of a dollar bid on that. It's probably going to push euro dollar lower. It's going to push cable lower. Um, but overall, I really don't expect it to break out of the overall ranges that we saw earlier although we've seen thus far today and even if we do I think 108.20 on euro dollar will be the limit of the downside um, you know these these numbers are okay they're positive but they're not particularly wonderful I mean a nice upward revision to um, to uh, October from 271 to 298 but overall not really shifted the dial um, it looks like we're probably going to get a, a, a rise in interest rates of 25 basis points in December um, and and that really hasn't changed. It hasn't changed the dial. I think. I think pretty much we are. We're pretty much back where we were. Um, uh, you know, about 10 minutes ago. Um, it's a pretty neutral number. The Canadian jobs number is probably slightly um, more disappointing. But Definitely the, more disappointing. But even on the Canada, it's not really having that much of an effect. Let's look at it. Let's see what Yeah, it well, is. here's the interesting thing on Canada. So Canada, full-time increase 36,000, part-time decrease 72,000. So that should offset the, the headline number is the uh, you actually had a big pickup in, uh, in full-time employment. So that actually is, uh, is somewhat encouraging. Yeah, and we've had a slight increase in the labor, partic- labor force participation rate in the U.S. It's gone up from 62.4 to 62.5. The unemployment rate has remained unchanged. We're looking at looking at the slightly greater details. The underemployment rate in the U.S., however, has gone up from 9.8 to 9.9. So the underemployment rate has increased. So I suppose, you know, you've got a fairly good non-farms number, but on the flip side of that, underemployment has gone up. So, you know, is that a, is that is that... Is that a function of the slight increase in the labour participation rate, or, or is that just because there's there's more part-time jobs been added than full-time jobs? It's you know it's really hard to say. But as I say, I'm sort of you know clutching at straws a little bit here to sort of get any indication as to where we go to next. But certainly in the context of the CAD jobs report, it's not a good Canada report. It's a, it's a positive U.S. report, um, but overall, um, I really don't think that we're we're, we're going to go too far today. The upside on dollar CAD 134, downside 133. You can probably throw a blanket over it in the same way that you can throw a blanket over 122 dollar yen, 124 dollar yen. Um, let's have a look at um, gold because one of the things that did surprise me yesterday when Mr. Draghi decided not to be as dovish as um, he thought, as, as everyone thought he would be was how how muted the reaction was in terms of the gold price. Certainly, um, we got a very, very muted reaction there. We got a significant amount of dollar weakness, but we, it wasn't really reflected in the gold price. And I think the reason for that is, once again, um, this, this U.S. rate hike, we need to get it out of the way, um, and then we can get a better idea of where gold is going to next. So the big level for me is 10.44. It's the 2010 lows. We're still above that, but we haven't as yet managed to get really back above this trend line here, which I'm going to draw in on the four-hour chart to give you a better indication of where it is. We can see that the trend is quite clearly lower here. So until such times as we get any clarity on where that's going to go next. Um, it's, I also it's, still think... 
that cool. gold is just too close to a thousand dollars and I still think it's it's being drawn towards it and I, I still suspect it. Just like we saw the US dollar index in the last few weeks get drawn up to a hundred, peaked mm. above it and then got pounded down. I think you could see the reverse happen in gold where it's just steadily drawn down over the next while towards that thousand dollars. Maybe it breaks below it, flushes out a few stops and some weak hands and that might be the clean out. Cause, I mean, RSI in, in, in stochastics gold looks like it should be bottoming out and it should be mm. getting ready to move much higher than it actually has been, and I think it's just because of that round number effect that is 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 holding it back a bit. It's just basically detracting it a little bit, like a magnet. Yes. Okay. So let's look at let's look at let's look at crude oil because I think crude oil could still have a part to play with respect to um, what the Fed might do. It's unlikely, but I think if crude oil continues to decline, then I think we could see. Um, I think we could see some questions raised about the Fed's dual mandate um, and the fact that they're missing their inflation target. And if if you get further oil weakness, dollar strength, the argument could well be made that um, the Fed it might be worth holding off because the last thing that you'd want to do if you're the Federal Reserve is to tighten policy and push oil even lower and reinforce that deflation, that disinflationary effect that currently is absolutely killing the manufacturing sector in the U.S. You look at the ISM manufacturing survey earlier this week, it, was, it hit its lowest level since June 2009. Well, in June 2009, the Fed has only just started QE1. Um, so you've got this perverse situation at the moment whereby the manufacturing sector in the U.S. is back at levels that we saw in 2009 when the Fed was loosening monetary policy. It's now back at those same levels and the Fed is tightening monetary policy. So it does seem It'll rather, be interesting. It, it, it'll, it'll be interesting, absolutely, because all yeah, of these manufacturing I... jobs are high-paid, highly skilled jobs. Yes. And I always want to mention. Go on. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael, and then I'll talk about crew, uh, OPEC. And they're being replaced by lower-paid service sector jobs. So yes. the disposable income of the U.S. economy is going down. And Absolutely. You, know, you, you, you mentioned in your retail sales numbers that Black Friday retail sales were a little bit weak, and we could actually mm -hmm. get a good good early indication of how that went next week. Next, I think it's next Thursday when we get U.S. retail sales. Yeah. The other part of which is in what you mentioned on the manufacturing is also true about the oil patch, where you've got really, really high-paying oil patch jobs have been lost this year, and, and a lot of those the people that have lost those jobs are not going to be making the same kind of money uh, in their next job. That, that, and because of that, I think that's what you're seeing. And one of the things you have seen play out, the high-end high -end retailers in particular have really been getting crushed. You saw terrible numbers out of Tiffany and out of Macy's and Nordstrom, and they're just – and I think that that effect is still – working its way through. Uh, just to talk about crude oil for a minute, crude oil still has the potential to be really active today. We've got an OPEC uh, meeting underway as we speak, and the press conference is supposed to be at uh, 3 o'clock London time, uh, 10 a.m. New York time uh, and Canada time, So it's a, uh, and 4 o'clock in, in Vienna where they're actually meeting. So the uh, and on that, I mean, there's been time, we've seen 4% moves up and down in crude oil this week based on uh, speculation of is Saudi Arabia going to uh, start to talk to everybody about maybe trying to stabilize the market or are they going to keep the price where we're going? I think they're going to not do anything to production this time, but maybe they'll start to say a few conciliatory things. But it'll be interesting to see because we've had 40, this uh, 40 has been pretty heavily defended in the last few days. Every time it drops below, the Saudis suddenly start talking nice and it gets back above and and the, the denials come out. So we'll see what happens there. But it seems to me as though we're, as we get into this 35 to 40 range for crude is, is the level of pain threshold for a lot of the producing countries below which they, they start to run into real problems. And I think that's why we're seeing 40, you know, 38 to 40 starting to get defended. So we'll watch the uh, crude oil very closely because that's something that will play out over the next couple of hours. I think talk is cheap. And I think uh, the market yeah. are getting wise to the fact that 
Um, a year ago, um, Saudi was talking about defending $70 a barrel, and ultimately the market called that bluff, and we haven't yep. been and we haven't been back above that since. So yeah, you by all means talk about defending $40 a barrel, but ultimately you're going to have to put your money where your mouth is. And mm -hmm. at the moment, the market's getting wise to it. Look at the direction of travel here, ladies and gentlemen. We've got lower highs and we've got lower lows, and we've we've peaked out here in September and October around about $54 a barrel in Brent. We're retesting the lows that we saw in August for Brent. So that $42 a barrel level is very, very key. But look at every single rebound that we've had. Each, yeah. low, each high has been progressively lower. So we're at a very, very key point here. This resistance level here at 46 is key. But what I think is more important here is this could actually get led oh, by U.S. crude. That. Sure. Look at the uh, look at the stochastics rolling over too. Lower high, lower high, and the recent one's a failure at 50. If that 42 gets broken, it's in big trouble. I mean, 40 will be easy, but that'll probably get taken out too. This thing would be in big trouble if that 42 fails. Maybe we'll go uh, to WTI yeah. now. No, absolutely. And now let's look at WTI. What's interesting to note about this WTI chart is we actually haven't retested the August lows. But mm -hmm. we have broken the lows that we saw in October, and we haven't been back above them. And this is $43 a barrel. And at the moment, we, we, have, the, we have flirted below $40 a barrel. We haven't been able to sustain, sustain a move below it. But again, look at the highs relative to the oscillator. And you draw the highs through and here. Failure, and failure at 50. Yeah, failure at 50 with the 200-day moving average still there, 50%, and and the 200-day moving average. So we could we could squeeze higher on U.S. crude to around about 42, 43 dollars a barrel. But ultimately, unless or until we break above this trend line here that I've just drawn in, um, then I think again the line of least resistance is lower. And thirty-seven dollars, $37.4 a barrel is the line in the sand for US WTI. Mm -hmm. Get below that, and then really you're looking at $35 a barrel. Why is $35 a barrel important? Well, I'll tell you. It's basically because it was the lows that we saw in 2008, which was these lows that we saw here when we dropped from $143, $144 a barrel all the way down to 35 so that, that's really, really the, the big, big chart point, the U.S. crude, the 2008 lows. But again, you can see here, lower high, lower low, the trend is clearly down, and it's going to take something significantly, um, I think, out of the ordinary to break us out of the malaise that we're currently seeing here as we head into the end of the year. Could the FOMC do it? It's an, interesting, it's an interesting premise, and certainly it's something that Colin and I will discuss when we preview the FOMC on the 16th of December on a webinar like this. So those of you who are interested in basically getting a preview of the Fed meeting on Thursday, the, no, Wednesday, the 16th of December, um, you can basically log into that, you know, register that via our website. That could be a very interesting conversation um, in just under two weeks' time, and I certainly think it'll probably be worth um, having a listen to. Colin, is there anything else you want to go through? I know you wanted to talk about the commodity currencies, didn't you, because of the rebound that we've seen in copper prices and what have you today. Yeah, let's look at the Aussie and the Kiwi dollars as well, because we've done dollar CAD already. Yeah, we've done dollar CAD. So let's look at the Aussie, and I think the Aussie is quite key. Let's look at this chart here, which I've prepared earlier. Again, we're pushing against the upper boundaries of a move that's been unfolding over the course of the last few months. We've got the 200-day moving average there. We've linked these highs through here, and I think it's really all about what does the RBA do? Um, you know, in the context of the Australian economy. Is there a likelihood that they could ease monetary policy further? How will China and the Chinese economic data that we've got coming out over the next week or so affect the Australian dollar? Because I think we've got, um, we, we, we've got some Chinese economic data coming out in the next couple of weeks, don't we? Um, yeah, retail should, sales, yeah. Retail sales. Industrial production and, and production, uh, inflation. And and trade yep. and CPI and, and, trade, yep. and, and all of that nonsense. So, um, so yeah, definitely. Um, 
So, so basically, what we've got at the moment on the Aussie is the makings or the beginnings of a potential bearish reversal, but um, we haven't closed today yet, so it's not quite complete. But certainly this trend line resistance from the August highs is going to be a very, very key level along with a 200-day moving average above it. So it's a, are you done with this, Colin? Can I move to the uh, yep. Kiwi? Absolutely. And the Kiwi... It's, it's the quite interesting similar. one for next week. It, this is the Kiwi. Yeah. So let's let's make it a daily chart so you can see the uh, original chart that I've got here. So we've got the October highs. Let's change that to four hours. And you can see that's actually quite a nice little chart that's unfolding now. And I'll let you tell the story on that, Colin, for what we've got next week. Certainly. Next week we have the RBNZ meeting, and and one of the things that I've been feeling is that the Fed kind of has put the other cent uh, central banks on notice that, that they're kind of getting ready to start raising rates, or what I've called last call at the liquidity party. It's similar to when we saw the ECB kind of signaled back in January that uh, that they were going to bring in QE, and then we saw that the S&P dropped their peg, and, and, and a whole bunch of other central banks did things. So people have had their chances to do, if you want to get in any more easing, here's your chance before the Fed starts going the other other way. So this week we saw the RBA pass, the Bank of Canada pass, the RBI pass, Europe didn't, ECB went not as much as people thought. Next week we've got the uh, RBNZ and the Bank of England. So RBNZ is uh, is quite significant here because we've had a rebound in the Kiwi dollar, but at the same time there's, a, there's some expectation that they could resume their uh, resume cutting rates again. They had cut three of the, they've, they've taken back three of the four rate hikes of uh, 2014. They raised four times. 2015, they've cut three. They've still got room to cut one more to get back to uh, to where they had been if they want to do it. Overnight, their commodity prices uh, index came in, and it was really negative. It was way below uh, expectations. So they're still seeing some softness there. So it is possible. We look at this in light of the fact that uh, that it's uncertain as to whether the, uh, the RBNZ is going to cut or not next week. And, uh, and and that's quite significant. And maybe you want to uh, have any comments on the Bank of England? Yeah, we can talk about the Bank of England. I don't think that the Bank of England um, will do anything or even give any indication that they're going to be doing anything until they know what the Fed's going to do. And sure. yeah. I, think, I think with respect to cable, um, what I was saying just before the numbers came out hasn't changed. I think there's a little, you know, significant amount of resistance at the highs of today between 150.140 and 151.50. Um, but I think the downside should well be, could well be limited to around about 150.20, 150.50. 30. Um, Euro sterling, slightly different ball game. Um, you know, it really depends on whether or not you think the ECB is done. Um, I think leading into the meeting, there was an awful lot of speculation that, you know, the ECB was going to go all in. They didn't go all in, and it's not a surprise. You look at the economic data that's coming out of Europe, it's improving. You've got services PMIs at four and a half year highs. You've got manufacturing PMIs at 18 month highs. You've got unemployment coming down. Um, you've got um, inflation higher now than it was um, at the beginning of this year when, when, the, when the QE program started. And overall, you've got resistance in euro sterling around about 72, 40, 50. So at the moment, could I add one thing there, Michael? Yeah. Sure. On that, on the data, the the one thing also I have found really interesting over the last few months is, that, you know, for the last several years, Germany was driving the bus, right? But in the last few months, the one thing we have seen is is that a lot of this improvement is coming from the Mediterranean countries, Spain and Italy in particular, have actually been putting up some pretty decent numbers for the first time in in a really long time. So that's actually I, I find encouraging as well for for Europe is that the, the the weakest lagging areas are starting to bounce back. I mean, Greece is the Unto itself, but the two biggies, Spain and Italy, actually are starting to turn around a bit, which I find quite encouraging too. There is, but I would argue that actually that's probably not as a result of the ECB's quantitative easing program, but because True. of the stimulative effect of lower oil prices. And, w w and, and we've seen oil prices. Um, make up a large part of the deflationary or disinflationary cycle within Europe. But I think it's also important to remember those effects will drop out in February or March next year. So yeah. as I say, the big level on, on Euro sterling is 40.50, 72.40.50, but support around about 71.70, 71.80. Where we go to next, I think it's hard to say, 
but I would be surprised if we we, we went back above 73 cents on euro sterling. I think the likelihood is that's where the top side level is, and we'll drift back down towards around about 71. However, why do I think that um, oil prices will, basically, in the disinflationary effect of oil prices will drop out in February, March? Well, it's quite simple. We look at this, pro this chart here. This is a chart that I've shown you guys before. We look at when the oil price bottomed out. It bottomed out at the end of the beginning of January, February 2015. Then oil prices started to rally. So in March, when we get the February inflation numbers, that this decline here will have gone. It will no longer be in the inflation numbers. And as we go into March, April, May, and June, this rebound in oil prices will no longer have the negative pull-down effect on inflation and actually help underpin the inflation numbers in Europe going forward for at least six months or so before we get to here and then we start to track lower again. Uh, quite, you know, that's, for me, that's an interesting chart because it's, it suggests that you know maybe we will start to get flattened out. And uh, just a headline just come out of OPEC. OPEC has agreed to oil output policy rollover, whatever that means. In other words, no change. So no change. Thirty-one point five. Thirty-one point five. So basically, no cuts. No cuts. So that could well see. Um, that could well see uh, the market. Yeah. Uh, We've seen the WTI the in the last over. five minutes has gone from 41 to 40.30. So far, WTI is holding 40 bucks. If mm. it does bust that, then uh, then we'd be looking at at, uh, at moving uh, potentially lower. Okay. And then it's bounced off 40.25 to 40.50. So it's kind of it seems to still be holding. It looks like a lot of people were kind of expecting that. No, I'm yeah. seeing mixed signals on whether they're including Indonesia or not. So I don't know. That, that could still knock it around a bit. Yeah, I mean that that tells you there all you need to know. So we got we dropped so pretty much we've pretty much dropped to just under a just under a dollar on that. Yeah. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, that is pretty much it for this month. Um, just to say just a quick reminder to say there's one more webinar this month. It's the pre FOMC webinar with Colin and myself, and I say that's on the Wednesday. Um, I think it's on the 16th of the December. The 16th at uh, 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. GMT. London time. So go to the yeah. education section on the Canadian website or the UK website, register for that, and um, we can basically um, have a chat about what to expect from the Fed. Looks like we're going to see um, a rate rise, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not they actually do raise rates or whether they bottle it slightly and decide to get rid of the band and just have a fixed Fed funds rate of 0.25%. That would be something, because at the moment it trades in a band of 0 to 0 0.25. They could raise rates without actually raising rates by removing the lower bound. That's something. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely a possibility. Because it would get them off zero. So that's one option. Anyway. Unless there's any questions, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today, and um, hope you all have a good weekend, and I hopefully we'll all talk to you again on Wednesday, the 16th of December. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day trading.